whether you like it or not, there is an inherent risk involved with our love for two wheels. Now that could be crashing, speeding, insurance, other drivers, dead badges or anything else for that matter. And we're frequently harassed for legal advice on a regular basis. We are not legal experts, which is why we've teamed up with White Dalton Motorcycle Solicitors to bring you free legal advice. Welcome back to another Legal Corner. Andrew, thanks for joining us. No problem. Or thanks for allowing me to join you. (laughs) Uh, Today we are going to talk about a, a very common subject and that is... Uh, an insurance theme, but to put simply, why do insurance companies ask all those questions? And to me, and to probably all you guys, they seem irrelevant at the time, but I'm guessing they're not. No, they're not. There was a big change in 2013 which came into insurance law. Prior to 2013, you had a duty to declare anything which the insurers might be interested in. And what you think about that, that's completely arse about face. Why should you or I know what our motorbike insurers need to know about us. Mm. But that was the old rules. After 2013, the rules changed, which is why the questions became a lot more detailed because the, the, the old test was, should you have told your insurer? Yeah. They didn't have to ask you. Post 2013, the rules are, they must ask you because if they don't ask you, they're not interested in the answer. Therefore, it won't make any difference to the policy. So the ones which, for those of your, um, uh, your YouTube viewers that can remember pre-2013, they didn't bother asking you whether or not you took a pillion, for no. example. That, that's a question that's come up since 2013. And the reason for that is, if you've got a pillion, so for example, I'm riding this bike, and I've got a pillion, and I have a crash, and it's my fault, I am liable for any injuries the pillion suffers. So when the insurers write your insurance... How? So you're liable to any damages to the pillion? Yeah, if, if, if I fall off and it's my fault, yeah. okay, I'm, right. I'm liable for... Because, okay. The pillion has trusted me, so it's my wife. Mm. My wife has trusted me not to go and ride like a twat and crash the bike. Yeah. Or, you know, I can hit a pothole. You know, whatever happens, I've got control of the machine. The pillion hasn't. If I fall off, the primary liability is likely to fix to me, unless I can point to somebody else and say, well, actually, it was the car that T-boned me. So the reason I ask if you have a pillion, and even if you only have the most occasional pillion rider, declare it. Right. Because the day you have a crash, if you've got a pillion on board, what the insurers can say is, you told us something which you knew to be false, because this is the test. After 2013, if they ask you a question, you must answer it honestly. Mm. If you answer it dishonestly or recklessly, I never carry a pillion. Well, you, you've got a pillion. Who was on the back of your bike? Yeah. If you do that, then you've got real problems because the policy can be voided. So if they ask you, for example, if your bike's stolen, and this is one we get all the time, and this has been particularly true during the lockdown phase, people would phone us and say, well, my bike's been stolen from outside work and uh, the insurers are refusing to pay out because I said I would not use the bike for commuting. Well, your insurers, you, you've, asked a, you, you've been asked a specific question, do you use your motorcycle for commuting or travel to work? No, I only use it for some social, domestic and pleasure. They've asked you a direct question, you've answered it falsely. Yeah. You say, well, my circumstances have changed, I didn't want to get on the train because of all the COVID bugs sitting around, I'm using my bike. Well, fine but your insurer's covered you for basically weekend riding and you're using your bike seven days a week. So obviously your risk has gone up. They are covering a much greater risk. So they can say, no, 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 sorry about something that. Is, something as small as, I say, relatively small as that can change the whole outcome of uh, It of can. Event. And what the insurers can do is, if your bike's stolen, if you have been either dishonest or reckless, that you said something which is patently false and you could not have believed it to be true, or you've been utterly careless as to the truth, they can say, I'm sorry, but we're not paying you out on your bike. Mm. They have to reimburse you your premium because the premium, the, the, the policy becomes, in, to use a bit of Latin, void ab initio, void from its very outset. You bought that policy on a false premise. So they go, right, there's your premium back, See Mr. Fagan, yeah. but uh, your, your pile of expensive fiberglass, unlucky. Right. We're not paying for it. Other ones are, my bike's in a brick-built garage. Well, it turns out you haven't got a brick-built garage. It's the, the same old insurer, and then there's one in particular, and I, I can't name it, but I'm going to suggest... Oh, go no, I can't. I no. really, really can't. Um, but before you go out to buy your insurance, have a wee look on the, the forums yeah. and look at the one insurer that seems to have two or three more complaints by volume than anyone else. Right. And this, these problems were why insurers try to wriggle out of policies, and this, this has got worse and worse and worse. 
since actually comparison websites came in, in my experience, and yeah. it's just purely from, from my perspective, but since um, comparison websites came in, the only thing insurers can compete on is price. Now they're covering the same risk, they're covering the same bikes, the repair costs are the same. So if they're cutting, if they're going to compete on premium, they get a certain amount of premium in. Mm. If that amount of premium goes, goes down, and they're still saying, paying the same amount of premium out, they're not going to make any money. So the easiest way for insurers to cut, to cut the price of premium is to make claims as difficult as possible. And it's a numbers game for the less than entirely straightforward insurers. I'm going to be slightly careful how I put this. <laughs> um, but I can certainly see a pattern with at least some insurers where whatever claim you make, they will reject it on some ground really or imagined. And it's usually the second or third go or when you invoke the internal complaints procedure that you go, all right, fair enough, he's not going to give up, we best pay out. And this has happened actually to one of my business partners here, he's a solicitor of about 12, 15 years standing, that said, well, we're not, we're not paying you, do you want to tell me why? No, not really, we just think you're in breach of the policy. They didn't even bother saying what breach they thought he was in. Um, it transpires that he'd had a non-fault collision, which was on a central database register, and again, that's something you've got to watch out for, because even if you have a non-fault accident, the insurers have a, a database which isn't based in the United Kingdom, which they can check on. And mm. the reason it's not based in the United Kingdom is because it get, gives them a get out under data protection. It's really quite cynical. But they said to, so to an admitted solicitor, who's a specialist motorcycle litigation firm, so probably the wrong person yeah. to say this to, was you didn't declare a non-fault accident. And if he hadn't kept his policy documents, if he hadn't kept the, the proposal, it's still called a proposal, because technically, if you go back to the pre-2013 law, I propose my motorcycle right. for you to insure. It's still so called a proposal. It's still called a proposal form. So that proposal form, he did declare the accident, but they said, oh, we don't have any record of it. Oh, here you go, here's, here's your money. Well, of course they had the record of it. It's work on the basis that insurance companies, or some of them, are going to do everything they can to avoid paying. And, and the, the classics are, your bike's stolen from your house, it's in a garage, you said, my bike's in a brick-built garage, and it's locked. Yeah. They will try, or some of them will, where they will try and force you to prove that your motorcycle was locked. Well, it's impossible, unless you're taking a photograph of your bike every time before you go to bed, which would be a bit weird. You can't prove it, but again, the burden is on them to show that your motorcycle wasn't locked. So how do they prove that though? They don't, they just no. allege it. Yeah. They just allege it and say, well, or they'll, they'll reverse the burden of proof mm. and say, well, you need to show us it was locked. And you go, well, I can't show that. How, how can I yeah. show you that? Because also motorcycle thieves, I don't call them professional, but the industrial ones, the ones that are doing it on, on the kind of scale where I think most bikes get stolen. Most bikes are not stolen by tear away lads who rag it around no. the field. They are stolen, usually stolen to order and usually find their way um, outside of Great Britain and Europe. The thieves that are doing it are what the police call forensically aware. So they'll take everything? They'll take everything. Yeah. They'll take the locks with them, they'll take yeah. the chains with them, they won't leave anything which gives a clue as to how they got into the, into the bike. They'll try and do things uh, quietly and cleanly, creating the least amount of suspicion. If you can say, well, here's my, here's my um, Abbas granite fashion gold lock in two pieces by the side of my bike, well, you're not going to see that because they're no. taking everything away with them. And the choice will go, well, there's no wreckage of the, um, there's no wreckage of the um, uh, locks left. So uh, we suggest that the, the motorcycle wasn't locked. And they will, they will really, really try and catch you out. So when you fill in that proposal form, look at every question as a potential method okay. for the insurers yeah. to wriggle out of it. So yeah. if your bike is locked, you say that on your yeah, my bike's locked and they will be specific. They'll say, is it a gold standard lock? Yeah. Has it got a fashion immobiliser on it? If you don't know, say no. Yeah. It hasn't got it. Because they can't say to you, you've increased the risk. Because the test that they will then apply is, if you've said something which is either reckless or dishonest, they can just completely void the policy. They've got a second catch, which is if you've made an innocent and understandable error, say for example, you've bought you know, a decent quality lock, but it's silver standard, not gold. And they can say, ah, well, if you said to us you were using a silver standard lock rather than a gold standard lock, we would have increased your premium by 20%. Therefore, 
because you've only paid 80% of the premium that you should have paid, we will only pay 80% right, of the value okay. of your bike. Yeah. And that, rather I've than the- I've heard that one before. It was, yeah. happened plenty of yeah. times. But where they've really got you by the short and curlies on that one is, unless you can lead evidence of the underwriting risk of that bike, well, neither of us are insurance underwriters, we would have to, you, if say that happened to your bike, you would have to get expert evidence from a motorcycle underwriter saying, that is not the discount which would have been given. And they will be saying, well, here are our underwriters, here are our underwriting criteria, it's 20%. So if that happens, you will get, say, 80% of the value of your bike back. Right. For making an honest error, and whether or not it makes any difference, because if somebody's got cutting gear, getting through a gold standard lock or a silver standard lock, you're talking about nanoseconds. Mm. It really doesn't yeah. make that big a difference. I mean, just, just going back to the uh, declaring things, I mean, I for one, I know I'm not, I'm not alone here. I guarantee you there is, there's probably thousands out there as well. Just for the sake of trying to get my policy down, my premium down, mm. I've, said, I've said, oh, maybe, or uh, I think I have, I think I have got this certain thing or this certain mm. modification. Um, or, or I've not got or, these points on my license. It, well, no, no, I haven't, I haven't gone that far. No, I haven't right. declared certain things in order to get my premium down. I mean, I, d I had no idea that it had this much effect. Well, again, it, it, it was some insurers, and I think this is the rational way for insurers to deal with it, is there's, there's one big insurer at least who says, we will insure your bike for its street value. Yeah. So say for example, this, the, the, my, my, my Triumph, they'll say, well, we'll pay you the market value of the motorbike, but your sat nav, your luggage, your racks, your taller screen, yeah. all of those, they're not insured. Well, they can do that because they say, we'll insure you for a standard bike. Yeah. All the bits you bolted on, that's down to you. We're not insuring yeah. them. And I, I, for what it's worth, I think that's fair enough. Mm. Others will ask you to declare everything. But you, again, you, you and I have been around since before 2013. Do you remember when insurers used to ask if you had sat and having luggage fitted? Yeah. 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 Well, they don't bother anymore. Um, they, they rarely bother because it doesn't make any great difference to the overall value of the bike. Prior to 2013, if you said, I don't have sat nav, but you did, they would try and wriggle out of the claim. Now, because it's not, because they can't show any underwriting yeah. loss for it, uh, they don't attempt to get away with it anymore. But the, the real one which causes you significant difficulties is if you've got something like a power commander or a full um, acro system on it, right. which puts affects... an extra five BHP on the bike. Right, okay. So if you've yeah. got something which increases the performance of the bike and you haven't declared it, yeah. the insurers are on very, very solid ground to say, well, hang on, you, you spent 1500 quid on a full acro system. You spent six or 700 quid on the power commander system and having your bike um, rejetted, gosh, share my age rejetted, <laughs> <laughs> rechipped. <laughs> um, you knew you did that. Yeah. You, you definitely didn't forget laying out nearly two grand on your bike and on your form, have you made any performance modifications to the bike? No. So will that go against you in the court of that's, law that's because that is tuning of, the bike? Yeah, that is the kind of thing which an insurer could say, we would not have insured that bike. Right. We would simply have not have insured that bike. And also it's dishonest. Yeah. You know that you spent a couple of grand on performance parts on a bike. Yeah. You, you don't accidentally spend a couple of grand on performance well, parts on a bike. Well, the wife thinks so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and plenty yeah. of other wives out there think so. so. Yeah, well, indeed. Yeah. Um, but when you get into a slightly greyer area, I bought that bike off you. You haven't told me. I mean, I can see it's got an acro system on it, so mm. that's probably a bad example. But I might not see it's been chipped and got a power command yeah. on it. Because, you know, unless I've started taking the bike to bits yeah. and know what I'm looking for. And then with, with that one, if the bike gets... Um, stolen and recovered, and they paid you out for the bike, they go, well, hang on, this had a power commander on it. We wouldn't have insured the bike. And you go, well, I, I didn't know. It wasn't me that fitted it. I didn't know. And again, the, the suspicion would be that you would have to show that it was more likely than not that you didn't know. But that would then fall into the innocent mistake, which doesn't get punished um, in the same way that dishonesty or recklessness gets punished. So the, the the big point to take away from this is, when you get all those questions, even if you think they're a bit daft, answer them truthfully and absolutely keep your proposal form. Yeah. Keep, keep, keep that proposal form. Read it carefully and do not take it when, if you phone up and query something on your uh, proposal form, if the person over there goes, no, you don't need to worry about that. No, you send the proposal form in, send it in by PDF, keep a copy of it, because that document, as I said with one of my colleagues here, that made the difference between him being paid out on his bike mm. and not because he kept his paperwork. Don't work on the assumption that insurers, and particularly the cheaper the insurer, the more likely they are to try and rag you out of a claim. 
And talking of declaring things and going back to the tuning, mm. tuning sort of bolt-ons, accessories. So if I had a bike and I didn't declare it had cams or it had, you know, a, a, a power commander or certain yeah. things that aren't necessarily visible. Yeah. If I had an accident, how would that affect my insurance? Well, first of all, it's got to be discovered. So that's a pretty good right, point. Okay. So if it's something which is invisible, yeah. then most of the people that do the examinations on bikes aren't motorbike specialists. So you might get away with it, yeah. but if you don't get away with it, if, for example, I, I put some on a hairy cams on this and I crash my bike and my insurer discovers that I've got all kinds of performance parts on it. The insurer will say, well, we insured your bike fully comp on the basis that it was a standard bike. That's what you told us. You yeah. declared your, your, your racks and you declared your sat nav, um, but you didn't declare that you'd had uh, engine tuning work done. We're not gonna pay you on your fully comp policy. Now, if I throw my bike- Anything at all? No, they don't have to. No, really? if, if you can show that you made the mistake um, carelessly, then <laughs> rather than recklessly. So you could like a drunk purchase. <laughs> yeah, I accidentally <laughs> yeah. bought a power yeah. commander. But that's what I say, the power commander is a good example, which yeah. is accidentally fit one. And there's one other word of warning, and this is really, really important. If you take anything away from this, take this one away. When you sell your bike, you must tell your insurer you've sold it because we have come across, not frequently, really? yet, uh, uh, honestly, uh, the really? horror stories. I've never that, done that. Well, then, then, <laughs> then start doing it from now okay. on. Um, I, I can tell you, this doesn't happen that often, but when it happens, it can be absolutely devastating. We've had um, a couple of cases which we've been involved in, luckily, for the, for the individual rider involved, they didn't have to coin a legal phrase, a pot to piss in, so they weren't mm. worth suing. But this story changes massive if you've got a house. If I sell you this bike, I've got a month left to run on my insurance policy, I want to get another year's no claims bonus on it, I sell you the bike, you take it away, you don't bother getting insured on it, you crash into a car, paralyze the driver of the car, you've got no insurance. My insurance insures the bike until I tell my insurer it's no longer on risk. I've therefore allowed you to ride my bike on their policy. They have to meet the claim for the paralyzed car driver, right. but because I wasn't riding the bike and I allowed you to use it, they can come after me personally and they can take my house off me. So do not ever think you are doing yourself a favor. Yeah. Hello, Bimoto. <laughs> yeah, make sure you tell yeah. them. Yeah, uh, we've seen, I'm going through the back of my head, I think of at least two or three that we've done, possibly more, and that's just me, where something like this is really, really badly unraveled. And luckily, touch wood, we'll find this Bosnian worked off. Um, the people that have been involved have been lads that live at home. They've got no assets, right. so the insurer's gone, well, we'll pay out, but we're very, very cross with you. Um, whereas if somebody had a house with equity in it, the insurers can and do come after them. And the worst ones to come after you are actually the Motor Insurers Bureau. Uh, if you uh, are uninsured on a motorbike or a car and the Motor Insurers Bureau pick up the injury claim or the claims of loss from the other driver that you've hit on an, insured, uh, on an uninsured bike, if you've not troubled to take yourself out of insurance, you go, oh, well, I'm insured without my beer, it's not a problem. Then we'll be come after you and they come after you hard. So yeah, don't, if you're running okay. around without insurance, it's, unless you are skint and you've got no money, it can cost you an awful lot. And definitely, 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 as soon as that, your buyer, as soon as their um, funds are cleared in your account, you handed the V5 and the keys over, you make the phone call to the insurer there and then. Okay. And you hang on the phone until you're dealt with, or at least drop them in. We communicate, say, this motorcycle is now off risk, I've sold it. And I sold the motorcycle at midday on whatever day you sold it. Right. You're now off risk because that can really come back and bite you properly hard in the arse. Thanks, Andrew. Learned a lot today. Cheers. Yeah, sort of cheer you up like that, Al. <laughs> Give you a little panic. Thank you. No worries.